Good evening. Welcome to sleep chamber. It is what it is. What happens, happens. And as for now, there's nothing you can do. There are puddles everywhere. The sky is gray. People are walking around with umbrellas. The weather is cold. Some people are wearing raincoats. Others are wearing boots. Everyone is carrying an umbrella. The wind is blowing. The trees are swaying. The leaves are wet. The ground is muddy. The rain is coming down hard. The streets are wet. The sidewalks are wet. The cars are wet. The rain is ruining people's hair. People are getting wet. Some people are walking faster to try and stay dry. Others are just walking slowly and getting wet. Some people are running. Everyone is trying to stay dry. I like the rain because it's calming and relaxing. It's also a good time to stay inside and read a book or watch a movie. Plus, rain makes everything smell fresh and new. I also love the sound rain makes when it's hitting the roof or the ground. It's just so peaceful. I think people who don't like the rain just haven't experienced it in the right setting. Rain can be romantic, too. I think it's one of the most beautiful things in the world. There is a monsoon season in Thailand where it rains a lot. Thailand's rainy season usually begins in May and lasts until October. The south and west coasts of the country are the wettest, while the east coast experiences the least amount of rainfall. Bangkok, in the center of the country, has an average rainfall of about 100 centimeters during the rainy season. During this time, thunderstorms and heavy rains are common and flooding is not unusual. How do you think the cloud feels like? Clouds are made up of tiny water droplets. When you touch a cloud, it feels wet. But they look dry and soft. They look comfortable to lie on. But if you try to lie on one, you would fall through it. They look like they would feel like cotton though. Have you seen a cottonwood? Cottonwood's trees are in the same family as willows and aspens. The seeds have fluffy white hair on them that looks like cotton. 
And when you touch the seeds, they feel like cotton too. So I think clouds would feel like lying on a bed of cotton. But instead of being warm and soft, they would be cold and wet. They would be like lying on a bed of cold, wet cotton. Wet cotton can feel clammy and uncomfortable. It can also be difficult to work with when wet. If you're working with wet cotton, it's best to wring it out as much as possible before continuing. Otherwise, the fabric will be difficult to manipulate and will take longer to dry. There are a lot of fabrics to choose from, but there are a few that you should avoid. Silk and polyester are two of the most common fabrics. They are both comfortable and look nice, but they are not very durable. They are also not very breathable, so they can make you sweat a lot. Cotton is a good fabric to choose. It is very durable and it is also very breathable. It is also a good choice for people who are allergic to polyester. Linen is another good fabric to choose. It is very strong and it is also very breathable. It is also a good choice for people who are allergic to polyester. The best fabric for a suit is wool. It is very strong and it is also very breathable. It is also a good choice for people who are allergic to polyester. When you are choosing a suit, make sure that you try it on first. You should also make sure that you get the right size. The right size is important, because if it is too small, it will be uncomfortable, and if it is too big, it will be difficult to move around in. The right size is important. Because if it is too small, it will be uncomfortable, and if it is too big, it will be difficult to move around in, period. I once met a cat that was wearing a suit. It was a very dapper cat, and it looked like it was ready for a day at the office. I have no idea why the cat was wearing a suit, but it was a very strange sight. The cat didn't seem to be bothered by the fact that it was wearing clothes and it seemed to be enjoying the attention it was getting from all the people who were stopped to stare at it. I have no idea where the cat came from or where it was going, but it was definitely one of the most unusual things I've ever seen. I can only imagine what the cat's owner must have been thinking when they decided to put a suit on their pet. It must have been one of those days where they were feeling particularly creative, or maybe they were just trying to make their cat stand out from the rest. Either way, it was a very interesting sight, and I'll never forget the time I met a cat in a suit. One day when I walked into a cafe, I saw a man sitting in the corner with a cup of coffee and a book. He looked up at me as I walked in, and I saw that he had kind eyes. I smiled at him and he smiled back. I ordered my coffee and sat down at the table next to him. 
We started talking and I found out that his name was John. He was a writer and he was working on a new novel. We talked for a while about books and writing. Eventually, we started talking about other things and we found out that we had a lot in common. We talked for hours and it was one of the best conversations I've ever had. At the end of the day, we exchanged numbers and promised to keep in touch. I walked out of the cafe feeling really happy. I was glad I had taken the time to talk to John. The book he was writing was published last week. It's a story about his childhood and how he became a writer. The book is called The Life and Times of a Writer. In the book, he talks about his early years growing up in a small town in upstate New York. He talks about how he loved to read and write, and how he always wanted to be a writer. He talks about how he went to college and got his degree in English, and how he eventually became a writer. In one chapter, he writes about a weird dream he had when he was a kid, where he was being chased by a giant giraffe. The giraffe was dancing salsa. The giraffe looked very graceful as it danced the salsa. It was moving its hips and its neck in a fluid movement that was mesmerizing to watch. The giraffe seemed to be enjoying itself immensely, and the onlookers were enjoying the show as well. The giraffe salsa dancing was a joy to behold, and it was clear that the giraffe was having a great time. After the dancing stopped, the giraffe received a round of applause from the onlookers. It was a wonderful performance, and the giraffe was a natural dancer. I don't know how that was related to his writing career. One of my friends once said, Actions speak louder than words. This is a very popular saying that is often used to encourage people to do something instead of just talking about it. It means that it is better to actually do something than just talk about doing it. I talk a lot. I never shut up. My friends say that I have verbal diarrhea. I just love to talk. I can talk about anything and everything. I'm the type of person who will start talking to strangers just to strike up a conversation. I'm also a big fan of gossip. Some people might find me annoying because I never stop talking, but I really enjoy it. I get a rush from hearing my own voice and sharing my thoughts and opinions. It's just how I'm wired. If you can't stand people who talk a lot, then you probably won't enjoy spending time with me. However, if you're the type of person who loves a good conversation, then we'll get along just fine. I don't remember any particular conversation that stands out as being my best, 
but I generally enjoy talking with people who are easy to talk to, have a good sense of humor, and are interested in learning about other people and cultures. I had a great conversation with a friend recently where we talked about our favorite books, movies, and TV shows. We also talked about our families and what it was like growing up. It was a really fun conversation and I felt like I got to know her a lot better. I also had a great conversation with a coworker recently where we talked about our favorite foods and restaurants. We also talked about our hobbies and what we like to do in our free time. If I were to start a restaurant, it would be called The Hungry Hiker. The menu would consist of appetizers, baked garlic bread, chicken wings nachos, soups, tomato bisque, chicken noodle, minestrone, entrees, Fettuccine Alfredo, spaghetti and meatballs, pizza, salads, Caesar salad, Greek salad. Chef salad, desserts, tiramisu, cheesecake, chocolate cake. We wouldn't have tables, just blankets like a picnic. The atmosphere would be very casual and relaxed. There would be a fireplace outside for people to roast marshmallows. The restaurant would be located in a mountain town near a popular hiking trail. The hungry hiker would be the perfect place to stop for a bite after a long day of hiking. The restaurant would be open year-round. In the winter, the fireplace would be lit and there would be a warm and cozy feeling inside. In the summer, the doors and windows would be open to let in the fresh mountain air. The decor would be rustic with hiking memorabilia on the walls. It would have paintings of wild animals. The paintings might show lions, tigers, elephants, and other animals in their natural habitats. I heard a story about a hiker and a snow lion. The hiker was walking through the mountains when he came across a snow lion. The lion was blocking his path and looked very angry. The hiker didn't know what to do, so he just stood there and waited. The lion said calmly, I'm not going to hurt you. I just want to talk. The hiker was surprised but happy to hear this. He said, okay, I'm listening. The lion explained. I'm tired of being hunted. Every day, I have to run and hide from humans who want to kill me. 
I'm just trying to live my life, but it's getting harder and harder. I don't know how much longer I can do this. The hiker felt sorry for the lion and said, I'm sorry to hear that. How can I help? The lion thought for a moment and said, I'm not sure. But it would be nice if humans could just leave me alone. The hiker nodded and said, I'll do what I can to help. I promise. The lion sat down and looked at the hiker. Thank you. I appreciate it. The hiker continued walking. The hiker continued walking until he reached the summit of the mountain. From the summit, he had a breathtaking view of the valley below. He could see the river winding its way through the valley and the trees and fields that surrounded it. He could also see the town in the distance, with its houses and shops. The hiker stood there for a long time, taking in the view. I met the hiker later that day at a pub. He picked up a knitting kit, a skein of yarn, and a pair of knitting needles from a nearby table. You met, I asked, pleased. Oh, yes. My mother taught me. I've always enjoyed it. Do you? I've never tried, I admitted. He looked at me with a quizzical expression. I find that hard to believe. You strike me as a woman who's tried everything at least once. Thank you. I think you're very perceptive. He smiled. I hope I am. It's a handy talent to have, if you ask me. You never know when you might need it. I'll have to take your word for that. He pulled out a chair for me, then drew up another for himself. Once we were seated, he opened the kit and handed it to me. I'm going to teach you to knit, if you'd like. I took the kit and studied it. I wouldn't want to cause you any trouble. No trouble at all, he chuckled. I've been wanting an excuse to teach you something. It's the only way I can think of to get you to sit still long enough to talk to me. I laughed. Is that so? Yes. You're always rushing off somewhere. I'm not usually so busy. Maybe not, but you seem to have a lot on your mind. I do. 
I closed the kit and placed it on the table. I have a lot to think about these days. Such as... I frowned, not sure if I wanted to tell him about my mother's illness. It didn't seem like the sort of thing one discussed with a casual acquaintance. Before I could decide what to say, he spoke again. I apologize for prying. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. It's all right. I took a deep breath. My mother is ill. I've been spending a lot of time with her lately. I'm sorry to hear that. His expression was sincere. Is it serious? It's hard to say. The doctors don't seem to know what's wrong with her. That must be difficult for you. I nodded. It is. I worry about her a lot. And your father. He's not in the picture. I see. He was silent for a moment. Then he said, if you ever need to talk, I'm a good listener. Thank you. I smiled at him. I might take you up on that one day. I hope you do. He picked up the knitting kit and handed it to me. In the meantime, let's see if we can get you started on that scarf. He taught me how to knit a scarf. I chose the colors red and yellow. He started by teaching me how to hold the yarn and needles, and then showed me how to make a slit knot. After that, he showed me how to do the knit stitch, and then the purl stitch. He told me that most scarves are made with just knit and purl stitches, but that I could get creative and add other stitches if I wanted to. Once I had the hang of the knit and purl stitches, he showed me how to do the increases and decreases that would shape the scarf. He told me that I could make the scarf as long or short as I wanted, and that I could make it as wide or narrow as I wanted, too. He showed me how to cast off when I was finished, and then helped me weave in the ends. I gave the scarf to my neighbor's cow and it suited her perfectly. Cows are wonderful creatures. They are gentle and loving, and they provide us with milk and beef. Cows are also great for the environment. They help keep the grass short, and their dung provides nutrients for the soil. Cows are a vital part of the agricultural ecosystem. The ecosystem is funny because it is always changing. For example, 
a new species of plant or animal could come into an ecosystem, which could change the way the ecosystem functions. Or, a change in the climate could cause a certain species of plant or animal to die out, which would also change the ecosystem. In short, the ecosystem is always changing, and it is always fascinating to study. I used to study a lot when I was in school. I would spend hours at my desk, poring over my books and taking notes. I was a straight a student, and I always made sure to be prepared for my tests. I wonder who came up with tests. They are the worst. Someone told me once that colors does not look the same to different people. His name was Joe. Kyo was a great guy. He always had a smile on his face and was always willing to help out. He was a great friend and always had your back. Kyo was the kind of guy that would give you the shirt off his back if you needed it. He gave me his shirt once. It didn't fit me. I don't think Joe ever knew that. Joe's mother was born in Italy, making Joe partly Italian. But he hated pasta. He was always ashamed of the fact that he hated pasta. Kyo was ashamed of the fact that he couldn't speak Italian fluently either. Kyo's mother always told him that it was okay to not like pasta and that there were plenty of other things to eat. His mother always told us how he was to grow up in Italy. She said that it was a very different experience from growing up in the United States. Italy feels like the most romantic place in the world, don't you think? I do think that Italy feels like the most romantic place in the world. There is something about the country that makes it feel very romantic and special. I think that a lot of the romance in Italy comes from the fact that the country is so beautiful. There are so many stunning views and locations, and the architecture and history are also very romantic. Additionally, the food and wine in Italy are also very romantic, and I think that the Italians themselves are generally very romantic people. There is a lot of passion in Italy for many things, including food, art, fashion, and music. Italians are known for being very expressive and enthusiastic, and this passion is evident in all aspects of their culture. From the way they prepare and enjoy their food, to the way they dress and carry themselves, Italians exude a sense of passion that is unique and infectious. Even their language is filled with emotion and expressive gestures. So it's no wonder that when Italians get together, whether it's for a family meal, a night out on the town, or just a casual conversation, the result is always a lively and spirited exchange. I tried to learn Italian once, but I found it very difficult. I gave up after a few weeks. I can still remember a few words and phrases, but that's about it. I would like to try again someday, though. 
A phrase I remember is, Vore imparer el italiano, mai difficile. Which means, I would like to learn Italian, but it is difficult. I also remember, mai dispiace, non parlo bene italiano. Which means, I'm sorry, I don't speak Italian well. And, Harley and please. Which means, do speak English. That's all the Spanish I know. I went to a salsa club once and met a girl there. I asked her to dance and she said yes. We danced together for a few songs and then I asked her for her phone number. She said that she didn't have a phone. I was surprised and asked her how she gets around without a phone. She said that she uses a pay phone when she needs to make a call and she uses a friend's phone when she needs to text. I thought that was really interesting and I asked her if I could send her a letter instead. She said that would be fine and she gave me her address. I wrote her a letter a few days later and I included my phone number in it. A few weeks went by and I didn't hear from her, so I assumed that she wasn't interested. I was wrong. I received a letter from her a few weeks later. We started writing letters to each other. Once she wrote me this really long letter and I read it, and I was so touched by it. She wrote, I'm so glad that I met you at the salsa club. I never would have thought that I would find someone there that I would be so compatible with. I really enjoy spending time with you and getting to know you better. I hope that we can continue to write to each other and get to know each other even better. I think you're a really special person, and I'm really glad that we met. I wrote back to her and told her how much I appreciated her letter, and how touched I was by it. I told her that I felt the same way about her and I was really glad that we had met too. We continued to write to each other for a few months and then we decided to meet in person. We met at a coffee shop and we talked for hours. It was so great to finally meet her in person and to be able to talk to her face to face. She told me a story about how she had recently gone on a trip to visit her grandparents and she had to take a bus. She said that she was really nervous about taking the bus by herself but she did it and it was fine. The bus driver had been very nice to her. I feel like I only ever met nice bus drivers. Except for that one time when I was taking the bus in Lebanon and the bus driver was smoking and blew the smoke in my face. That was not a pleasant experience. But other than that, I have met some really nice bus drivers. One time, a bus driver in New York helped me carry my luggage up the stairs because I was struggling. That was really nice of him. 
Another time, a bus driver in Italy helped me find my stop because I was lost. So, overall, I have had some really great experiences with bus drivers. They have always been really nice to me. Anyway, me and the salsa girl kept writing letters to each other. We continued to write letters to each other for a while. But then she moved to another city and we lost touch. She told me about her move, of course. And I got her new address, but maybe my letter got lost in the mail. I miss writing letters. It was really fun. But now we just keep in touch via social media. It's not the same, but it'll have to do. I'm on so many social medias I can barely keep up Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, Tumblr. I'm even on some I don't really understand. But that's just the world we live in, I guess. The internet has taken over. Maybe I should build my own social media. That could be fun. It could be analog social media. Where you write letters to people. and send them in the mail. That would be so cool. I should totally do that. What would it be called? Analog book. No, that's not it. Post book. Yes, I like that. Postbook. It's a social media where you write letters to people and send them in the mail. I'm gonna make it. It's gonna be great. So Postbook will be for everyone that is sick of social media. I should start drawing a logo. Maybe a design of a pen and a letter I for ink would be appropriate. Or a simple abstract design in black and white. Or a design that incorporates both an image and the company name. There are many possibilities. It depends on what you want the logo to communicate about your company. If you want a professional and sleek logo, then a simple design would be best. If you want a playful and fun logo, then a design with more color and personality would be appropriate. I knew a designer that made the best logos in the world. He designed logos for Flower Poot, Apron Macron and other huge brands. You heard about Apron Macron, right? They make and sell the best aprons in the world. The aprons are so good, you'll never want to take them off. I highly recommend this designer. His name is Steve Maprom. You can find his website at the internet, I think. 
I got one of his aprons as a Christmas present. And I wear it all the time. I highly recommend Steve Mapron. He's the best. Besides doing the best aprons in the world, Steve was also great at baseball. He played all the time growing up and even played in college. Steve was drafted by the Baltimore Orioles in the fifth round of the 1971 Major League Baseball drive aft. However, he never made it to the majors. He played in the minor leagues for a few years before he was forced to retire due to an arm injury. Even though he never made it to the majors, Steve is still considered one of the best players to come out of his hometown. He was inducted into the city's Sports Hall of Fame in 2006. Steve is a great example of how you can be successful at something, even if you don't make it to the very top. He worked hard at baseball and was rewarded with a successful career, even though it didn't quite turn out the way he wanted it to. You can learn a lot from Steve's story, especially if you're pursuing your own dreams. No matter what you do in life, Always give it your best effort and don't give up, even if things don't go exactly the way you wanted them to. You never know where you might end up. When Steve ended his baseball career, he started making aprons. He often say that he is inspired by his sport career. The discipline, the hustle, and the dedication it takes to be a professional athlete is what drives him to be the best apron maker in the world. Just like in baseball, Steve gives 110% to his aprons. He puts his heart and soul into every single one, and it shows. If you're ever in the market for an apron, make sure to check out Steve's website. I have a surprise for you, actually. Steve is here in the studio. Welcome, Steve. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. So, Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit about your aprons? What makes them so special? My aprons are special because I put a lot of heart and soul into each and every one. I take the time to make sure that every detail is perfect, and I only use the highest quality materials. I really care about my customers, and I want them to have the best possible experience when they use my aprons. That's great, Steve. Tell us something about yourself, Steve. I am a father of four and a grandfather of six. I have been married for over 30 years. Wow. 30 years. Do you have any wisdom about being married you would like to share? I believe that communication is key in any relationship, but especially in marriage. You need to be able to talk to your spouse about anything and everything, and be able to really listen to them as well. Also, it's important to always keep the lines of communication open, even when things are going well. That way, if anything does come up, 
you can address it right away. I also think it's important to make time for each other, even when life gets busy. It's so easy to let other things take precedence over your relationship, but it's important to remember that your spouse should be your number one priority. Making time for each other, even if it's just a few minutes a day, can make a big difference. Finally, I believe that it's important to always show your spouse love and appreciation. A little bit of effort can go a long way in making your spouse feel loved and appreciated. I think those are the most important things when it comes to being married. Thank you, Steve. And four kids, tell us more. I have four kids, all grown up now. My oldest is 28 and my youngest is 22. I also have six grandchildren. I absolutely love being a father and grandfather. It's the best feeling in the world. I'm so lucky to have such a great family. I'm sure your kids and grandkids love you too. What is the best part about being a father and grandfather? There are so many great parts, it's hard to choose just one. I think one of the best parts is just being able to watch my kids and grandkids grow up and watching them achieve their goals. It's also great to be able to share my life with them and to have that special bond that only comes with being a family. I'm really blessed to have such a great family. How did you and your wife meet? We met at a party. We were both at a party and started talking. It was a birthday party. She actually came up to me and asked me to help her solve a crossword. Did I ever tell you that I am the greatest crossword solver in the world? Once I solved the crossword in two seconds. Wow, Steve, that is impressive. Two seconds, is that really the truth? Yes, it is. I don't believe you. Why not? Well, it just seems like something that someone as smart as you wouldn't be able to do. I don't think that's a very good reason. I guess you're right. I'm the greatest crossword solver in the world. I still don't believe you. Let's agree to disagree, okay? You're probably just saying that because you're modest. I'm not modest. I think you are. I'm not modest, I'm the greatest crossword solver in the world. Okay, Steve, I believe you. Good. I need to leave now, I'm going to solve a crossword. Okay, see you later. Wow, Steve, everybody. I always dreamed about meeting Steve. 
Another dream I have is that I own a beautiful farm that is surrounded by mountains. The farm has a big red barn and a big green field. The farm also has a pond with a waterfall. I have a lot of animals on the farm, including horses, cows, pigs, chickens, and ducks. I also grow a lot of crops, including corn, wheat, and oats. Then I sell my crops and animals at the farmer's market and make a lot of money. I am very happy on my farm and love my life. Someday I will make this dream a reality. However, I am allergic to many animals. So, I may have to find a different dream. I dreamed a weird dream last night. It was about a very nice little fish that was my best friend, and the fish could fly me anywhere in the world. I was flying around with the fish, and we were having so much fun. Then, all of a sudden, the fish turned into a big dragon. The dragon was so big and scary, but it was still my best friend. We were flying around and having fun when the dragon started breathing fire. The fire was so hot and it burned everything in its path. I was so scared, but I knew I had to help my best friend. So I grabbed a bucket of water and threw it on the dragon, and the dragon turned back into a fish. The dream was so weird, but it was also really fun. I'm not sure what it means, but it was definitely a strange dream. Are you asleep yet? If not, maybe you should try counting sheep. Once when I was counting sheep, I got up to 4,872 before I finally fell asleep. I don't think I've ever counted that high before or since. It was quite a night. I named one of the sheeps. Dolly after the famous sheep that was cloned. The others I just named after random things that came into my head. Butterfly, rainbow, unicorn, that sort of thing. It was a very eventful night, all things considered. I'm not sure why I'm telling you this, but I guess it's just because I can. Dolly is a good name for a sheep. Because it's short and easy to remember. I'm sure the other sheep said names too, but I don't remember what they were. Have you seen the movie Dolly? The movie is based on a book by the same name, and it tells the story of a girl who is sent to live with her father and stepmother in a small town in Maine. Dolly is a very precocious child, and she quickly befriends the local librarian, Miss Annie. Miss Annie helps Dolly to find her place in the small town, and she also helps Dolly to learn to read. Dolly is a very smart girl, and she soon learns to read at a very high level. She also starts to write her own stories, 
and she even starts to write a book about her life in the small town. The movie is very heartwarming. Heartwarming, isn't that a weird word? Anyway, I would definitely recommend the movie to anyone who is looking for a feel-good movie. I'm not sure if the book is still in print, but I'm sure you could find it used somewhere. Once I read a book, I can't remember the title or the author of the book, but it was about a woman who was in a car accident and she ended up in a coma. She had to learn how to walk and talk again and she had to relearn everything. The book might be called In a Coma or something similar. Anyway, it had a happy ending. The woman woke up from her coma and was able to fully recover. I don't remember much else about the book, but I enjoyed reading it. Did I ever tell you about the time I went swimming during the night in a lake in Italy? It was dark but very warm. I was visiting my friend in Toscany, and we decided to go for a nightly adventure. We walked down to the lake and started swimming. It was so refreshing and the water was so clean. And then I got bit by a fish. I screamed and my friend started laughing so hard. We woke up some campers when I screamed. They came down to us and joined in on our night swim. They were traveling as well. It was a couple from Australia that had just arrived to Italy last night. They told us that they had a great time in Italy so far and that the food has been amazing. They also said that the people have been very friendly and helpful. I got so curious because I've never been to Australia. They told us about koala bears. Apparently, they are very friendly creatures that are found in the wild in Australia. They also told us about the Great Barrier Reef, which is the largest coral reef in the world. It is located off the coast of Queensland, Australia. The Great Barrier Reef is a popular destination for scuba diving and snorkeling. The couple from Australia said that they are planning on going scuba diving there soon. I was so fascinated by everything they were telling me, and I really want to go to Australia now. However, I'm scared for sharks. But they told me that there are only a few types of sharks in the Great Barrier Reef, and that they are not dangerous to humans. I'm definitely going to try to go to Australia someday. It sounds like an amazing place. I'm so jealous that they got to go there already. Maybe I should visit Australia and New Zealand this winter. I would love to see Sydney and Auckland. In Sydney, there are numerous things to do in Sydney, Australia. Here are just a few examples. Visit the Sydney Opera House. Take a tour of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. 
explore the Royal Botanic Gardens. Visit Taranga Zoo. Take a ferry ride to Manly Beach. Wander through the Rocks District. Stroll through Hyde Park. Visit the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Explore the Bondi to Coogee Coastal Walk. I would go and surf on Bondi Beach. Not that I know how to surf, but I definitely want to try it out. I could learn, right? I would also like to learn how to bake sourdough bread. It feels very common to bake bread. Baking bread is a great way to relax and distress. There's something about the process of kneading dough and watching it rise that is very therapeutic. Plus, the end result is a delicious, homemade loaf of bread. If you're interested in learning how to bake sourdough bread, I read a few tips. 1. Start with a simple recipe. There are a lot of complexities that come with baking sourdough bread, so it's best to start with a basic recipe. This will help you get a feel for the process and allow you to troubleshoot any problems that may arise. 2. Make sure your ingredients are fresh. This is especially important when it comes to the yeast. If your yeast is old or expired, it won't work properly and your bread will be dense and heavy. 3. Be patient. Sourdough bread takes time to make, so don't get discouraged if it doesn't turn out perfectly the first time. They said that you just have to keep practicing and you'll eventually get the hang of it. I'm going to start practice to bake bread this weekend. It feels like a good Sunday activity. Anto her good Sunday activity is taking a walk in the park. And also doing laundry. I always do laundry on Sundays. I should probably start doing some laundry now. But it is not Sunday, so... I will just wait. On Sundays I also always go for long walks. I usually take my dog and walk by the water. It's a great way to get some exercise and fresh air. I also like to people watch on my walks and see what everyone is up to on their weekend. People watching is so much fun. I wonder what people think when they see me, when there are people watching. I've heard that I look like a celebrity, but people can never figure out who. I've also been told that I give off a vibe that is either intriguing or off-putting, depending on the person. I'm not sure what to make of these things, but they're interesting to think about. Do people see me as approachable? As someone who is friendly. As someone who is interesting. I guess it depends on the person. The word vibe 
feels like a very young person's word. I would not use it to describe someone, but maybe that is just me. I am not sure what people think of me when they see me. I just hope that I come across as a nice person. I think that is all anyone can really hope for. We all have different energy that we put out into the world and some people are just more drawn to that than others. I try to be a good person and I hope that comes across to people. I think that is all anyone can really do. Just be yourself and be the best person you can be. The world is full of so many different kinds of people and we should all try to respect one another. The flowers are supposed to bring you sweet dreams about your future husband. The tradition is called Birda Bambadid and it is said to originate from the 18th century. I tried it once, but it didn't work. Maybe because I am not a woman. But isn't that a bit unfair? Why can't men have sweet dreams about their future wives or husbands? Or maybe I did it wrong. I am not sure. I am not sure what the seven different kinds of flowers are supposed to be, either. I just used seven random flowers that I found in my garden. Maybe that was my mistake. In any case, it was a fun tradition to try out, and I would recommend it to anyone who wants to have a bit of fun on Midsummer's Eve. Just make sure you know what the seven different kinds of flowers are supposed to be, and maybe it will work for you. Other midsummer traditions is to dance around a maple and to eat pickled herring and new potatoes. New potatoes is a must on Midsummer's Eve. If you don't eat new potatoes on Midsummer's Eve, you will have bad luck for the rest of the year. That might not be true, but it is definitely a tradition. And it is definitely worth eating new potatoes on Midsummer's Eve, even if it doesn't bring you good luck. I really enjoy roasted new potatoes with rosemary and garlic. Another great option is boiled new potatoes with butter, salt and pepper. or mashed potatoes. I don't like nakai though. If I had to choose between never eating potatoes or never eating pasta again, I would choose to never have pasta again. I would rather never have pasta again than never have potatoes. I like both foods, but I feel like I could live without pasta a lot easier than I could live without potatoes. Plus, there are so many different ways to cook potatoes. You can bake them, fry them, mash them, and so much more. There are a lot fewer things you can do with pasta. Another midsummer tradition in Sweden is to eat strawberries and cream. This is usually served in a bowl with a glass of champagne or white wine. The strawberries should be ripe and the cream should be thick and rich. Yet another midsummer tradition is to sing songs. 
traditional Swedish midsummer songs are often about love, nature, or the summer season. Many of these songs are hundreds of years old. We also always go for a midnight swim at midsummer. Midsummer is the perfect time to enjoy the long Swedish summer nights. After dinner, we take a walk outdoors and then take a dip in the lake. The water is usually very cold, but it feels refreshing after a long day in the summer heat. After our swim, we sit on the dock and enjoy the view of the stars and the midnight sun. Midsummer is bittersweet though because after that the nights get longer again. I love the Swedish summer and all of the traditions that come with it. One thing I do every summer is to go camping. I usually go with my family or with some friends. We pack up the car with all of our camping gear and drive out to the countryside. We find a nice spot to set up our tent, and then we spend the next few days hiking, fishing, and exploring the area. I always enjoy camping because it is a great way to relax and connect with nature. Once when we went camping we got lost. It was getting dark and we couldn't find our way back to the campsite. We ended up spending the night in a cave. It wasn't exactly what we had planned. But life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Camping is relaxing to me because I love being outdoors and being in nature. I love being able to explore new places and hike through forests and mountains. I also love being able to sit around a campfire at night and relax under the stars. Camping is also a great way to bond with family and friends. I always enjoy spending time with the people I love, and camping is the perfect way to do that. We can cook together, play games, and just enjoy each other's company. We usually play board games such as Monopoly Scrabble Chess Checkers Cards Against Humanity Apples to Apples The Settlers of Catton, Pandemic. Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride is my favorite. The way you play it is, players start with a hand of cards, each of which shows a route between two cities. The object of the game is to collect cards and then use those cards to claim routes. The player who completes the most routes wins the game. To claim a route, a player must play a set of cards that match the route's length and color. For example, a player could claim a yellow route between Los Angeles and San Francisco by playing two yellow cards. The game is won by the player who has the most points at the end of the game. Coins are earned by claiming routes and by completing destination tickets. The game is very strategic which is so much fun. I highly recommend it if you like board games. 
My least favorite board game is Monopoly. I find it to be very long and tedious. I also find that it often leads to arguments between players. I much prefer games that are shorter and less competitive. I think that Monopoly is a game that people either love or hate. If you enjoy competitive games that take a long time to play, then you will probably enjoy Monopoly. If you prefer shorter, less competitive games, then Monopoly is probably not for you. I'm not very competitive. I'm more likely to cooperate than to compete. I'm more interested in working together than in winning. Sometimes I get happy if I don't win because I get happy by seeing the other that won. Some other things that makes me happy is I am happy when I am spending time with my family and friends. I am also happy when I am doing something that I enjoy, such as playing sports or listening to music. I like to play sports, but I have no ball control. Seriously, I am kind of bad at sports. Once, when I was around 12 years old, I was playing football. I was running for the ball and somebody tackled me from behind. I hit my head on the ground and was knocked out for a few seconds. While I was unconscious, I had a dream about a giant rabbit coming towards me. The rabbit was so big that it filled up my whole field of vision. It was coming closer and closer to me until it was right in front of my face. I could see its giant teeth and its big pink eyes. It was weird to see such a big rabbit. The rabbit looked at me and then it said, Hello. Hi, I said. The rabbit said, Don't be afraid, I won't hurt you. I wasn't scared, I just thought it was strange to see such a big rabbit. Then I woke up and the rabbit was gone. After that experience, I was always really careful when I was playing football. I'm always very careful, to be honest, in all kind of ways. I always think about what I am doing, and I never do anything without thinking it through first. That's just how I am. I guess you could say I am a bit of a perfectionist. I always want to make sure that everything is just right. I don't like taking risks. I would rather play it safe and not take any chances. I think that's why I am always so careful. It's just how I am. I don't know any other way to be. I guess you could say that I am a bit of a control freak. I like to be in control of everything, and I hate it when things are out of my control. I guess that's just my personality. I can't help it. It's just who I am.
My brother is the total opposite. He is never careful. He is always careless. He is always making mistakes. He is never paying attention to detail. Once he was out hiking, and he slipped and fell, and he broke his leg. It was a total mess. But my brother just brushed it off, and he kept going. That's just the kind of person he is. He's always moving forward, and he never looks back. Even when he makes a mistake, he just keeps going. He also went scuba diving, even though he was totally afraid of it, because he wanted to face his fears. And he did it. He overcame his fear. And he had a great time. My brother is always up for a challenge. And he is never afraid to take risks. I admire him for that. Did you know that I am Swedish? As a Swedish person, I am raised on a wooden culture. Have you ever heard the story of Sweden's founder, Bert Channeling? Bert Channeling was born in 1926 in Stockholm, Sweden. His father was a strict disciplinarian, and his mother was a homemaker. Bert Channeling was an intelligent and enterprising child, and he began selling matches to his neighbors at the age of five. He later expanded his business to include selling fish, Christmas decorations, and other items. When he was 17, he used his savings to start messing with people's minds, which initially was a bad thing. Bird channeling rapidly expanded in the years following its founding. In 1948, the guy introduced his first furniture line. His furniture was designed to be simple and functional, and it quickly became popular with consumers. In the 1950s, he began to expand internationally, opening his first store in Norway. By the 1970s, Bert Channeling was operating in multiple countries and had become a global brand. Bert Channeling is now one of the world's largest furniture retailers, with over 400 stores in more than 50 countries. The company's simple, functional, and affordable designs have made it a favorite among budget-conscious consumers. Bert Channeling's success is a testament to his vision and entrepreneurial spirit. Isn't that a crazy journey? It's always been said that life is a never-ending journey. No matter where we come from or where we're going, we're always on the move. Sometimes, it's a journey we take alone and other times, it's a journey we take with others. But one thing is for sure, it's a journey that is always worth taking. No matter what life throws our way, we always have the opportunity to learn and grow from it. Life is full of surprises, both good and bad. 
It's how we handle these surprises that defines us as individuals. The choices we make throughout our lives shape who we are and who we will become. There will be times when we stumble and fall, but it's important to remember that we always have the power to pick ourselves back up and continue on our journey. Life is a beautiful thing, full of love, laughter, and hope. It's a journey that is always worth taking, no matter what. Life is beautiful because it is full of possibilities. No matter what our circumstances are, we always have the potential to make something of ourselves. We can choose to be happy or unhappy, to love or to hate. Life is full of hardships and heartache, but it is also full of hope and possibility. We never know what tomorrow will bring, but we can always hope for the best. No matter what we go through in life, we always have the potential to come out stronger and wiser. We can choose to learn from our mistakes and make something better of ourselves. Life is full of second chances, and it is up to us to make the most of them. We may not be able to control everything that happens to us, but we can always control our own attitudes and reactions. We can choose to let the bad things that happen to us make us bitter or we can choose to let them make us better. It is up to us to decide how we want to live our lives. That got deep. Let me tell you about the world's greatest giraffe instead. Thomas, the funny giraffe, was born in the African savanna. He was the tallest giraffe in his herd and had the longest neck. His long neck was an advantage that allowed him to reach leaves that other giraffes couldn't reach. As a result, he was always the first to eat and grew up to be the biggest and strongest giraffe in his herd. Thomas's early life was filled with adventure. He would explore the savanna, seeking out new places to eat and play. He was always the first to try new things and wasn't afraid of anything. His long neck allowed him to reach leaves that other giraffes couldn't reach, which made him the envy of his herd. Thomas's success came from his willingness to take risks. He was always the first to try new things and wasn't afraid of anything. His long neck allowed him to reach leaves that other giraffes couldn't reach, which made him the envy of his herd. As a result of his adventurous nature, he became the biggest and strongest giraffe in his herd. Thomas's biggest contribution was his willingness to take risks. He was always the first to try new things and wasn't afraid of anything. His long neck allowed him to reach leaves that other giraffes couldn't reach, which made him the envy of his herd. As a result of his adventurous nature, he became the biggest and strongest giraffe in his herd. Thomas was a funny giraffe who lived a life of adventure. He was always the first to try new things and wasn't afraid of anything. His long neck allowed him to reach leaves that other giraffes couldn't reach, which made him the envy of his herd. As a result of his adventurous nature, he became the biggest and strongest giraffe in his herd. Thomas also had a friend growing up. 
a hippo named Stephen. Stephen the hippo was always a brave creature. When he was just a young hippo, he would often go on adventures by himself, exploring the vast plains of Africa. One day, Stephen decided to embark on a new adventure. He would travel to Iceland. He had always been fascinated by the country and its unique landscape. Stephen packed his bags and set off on his journey. The journey was long and difficult, but Stephen persevered. Finally, after weeks of travel, Stephen arrived in Iceland. He was immediately struck by the beauty of the country. Stephen explored Iceland for many weeks, marveling at the glaciers, the waterfalls, and the northern lights. He even made friends with some of the local animals. One day, Stephen stumbled upon a group of humans who were hunting a whale. Stephen was horrified by this and decided to intervene. Stephen charged at the hunters, scattering them. He then led the whale to safety. The whale was very grateful and thanked Stephen for his bravery. News of Stephen's heroic deeds spread quickly throughout Iceland. Soon, everyone knew about the brave hippo who had saved the whale. Stephen became a national hero and was even featured on the news. He was happy to have made a difference in the world. Stephen continued to live happily in Iceland for many years, inspiring others with his bravery. He was truly a remarkable hippo. You know how I said that I am from Sweden? Let me tell you about the different seasons here in the north. Sweden is a country located in the northern hemisphere, and as such, its weather patterns are largely influenced by the changing seasons. In general, Sweden experiences four distinct seasons, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Winter in Sweden typically lasts from December to March and is characterized by cold temperatures with average highs ranging from minus five to zero degrees Celsius. Snow is also a common occurrence during the winter months and the country often sees a significant amount of snowfall Spring arrives in Sweden in April and brings with it warmer temperatures and longer days. The average high during this time of year is around 10 degrees Celsius. The spring months are also a time of increased rainfall. Summer is the warmest time of year in Sweden, with average highs reaching 20 degrees Celsius. The days are also longest during the summer months, with the sun setting as late as 10 p.m. Autumn arrives in Sweden in October and brings with it cooler temperatures and shorter days. The average high during this time of year is around 10 degrees Celsius. The autumn months are also a time of increased rainfall, Overall, the weather in Sweden is largely influenced by the changing seasons. The country experiences four distinct seasons, each with its own unique weather patterns. 
Sweden is a beautiful country that is worth visiting at any time of year. Sweden is bordered by Norway to the west and Finland to the east, and is connected to Denmark in the southwest by a bridge tunnel. Sweden has a long history and a rich culture. The Swedish people are known for their love of nature, and their country is often described as the land of the midnight sun due to its long summer days. Sweden has a strong economy and is known for its high standard of living. The country is also known for its generous welfare system, which provides free healthcare and education to its citizens. When I went to school, I loved to write essays. And I was really good at it. There is no one perfect way to write an essay, but there are some general principles that can help you get started and improve your writing. Now we'll explore some tips and techniques for writing a great essay, including how to choose a topic, how to structure your argument, and how to revise and edit your work. Choosing a topic. One of the most important steps in writing an essay is choosing a topic. You want to choose a topic that is specific enough to be interesting, but not so specific that you can't find enough to say about it. For example, if you're interested in the history of the American Revolution, you might choose to focus on a specific event, like the Battle of Bunker Hill. Once you've chosen a topic, you'll need to do some research to gather evidence and develop your argument. Try to find sources that are both reliable and relevant to your topic. In the case of the American Revolution, you might look for primary sources, like letters or diaries from participants in the battle, as well as secondary sources, like history books or articles. Structuring your argument. Once you have your evidence, you'll need to decide how to structure your argument. There are many different ways to do this, but a common approach is to start with an introduction that introduces your topic and provides some background information. Then, you'll present your argument in the body of the essay using evidence from your research to support your claims. Finally, you'll conclude with a summary of your argument and a call to action, if appropriate. Revising and editing. After you've written your first draft, it's important to revise and edit your work. This is where you'll make sure that your argument is clear and supported by your evidence, and that your writing is free of errors. You might also want to have someone else read your essay to give you feedback. With these tips in mind, you're ready to start writing your own great essays. Wow, now I started thinking about my high school years. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I was in high school, and life was both wonderful and terrible. On the one hand, I was young and carefree. I had my whole life ahead of me, and I was just enjoying being a teenager. On the other hand, high school was also a time of immense pressure. I was constantly worrying about my grades, my social life, and my future. But looking back on those years, I can say that overall, they were happy times. I made lifelong friends in high school, 
and I look back on those years with fond memories. Sure, there were some tough times, but overall, I had a great experience in high school. One of the things I remember most fondly about high school is the friendships I made. I was lucky enough to meet some really great people in high school, and we remain friends to this day. I don't know what I would have done without my friends during those years. They were always there for me, whether I was having a good day or a bad day. Another thing I remember fondly about high school is the sense of freedom I felt. I was finally out of my parents' house and living on my own. I could stay out as late as I wanted, sleep in as late as I wanted, and just generally do whatever I wanted. It was a great feeling, and I miss it sometimes. Of course, there were also some tough times in high school. I remember feeling immense pressure to do well in school. I was worried about getting into college, and I was also worried about my social life. I sometimes felt like I was juggling too many things at once. But looking back, I can see that those tough times made me who I am today. I learned how to handle stress and how to manage my time. I also learned how to be more independent. So even though high school was tough at times, I'm grateful for the lessons I learned. Overall, high school was a happy time in my life. I made great friends, I had a lot of fun, and I learned a lot about myself. I'm grateful for those years, and I look back on them with fond memories. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way, in short. The period was so far like the present period. that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received, for good or for evil. In the superlative degree of comparison only, there were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face. On the throne of England, there were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face. On the throne of France, the grass was green again. The young leaves were expanding on the trees. The birds were singing in the hedges. Spring had come once more. In the next room, at the present moment, 
where sits a man, middle-aged, who has seen a great deal of trouble in his time, and has had his share in all the doings of the last year. He is not an old man, but he is not a young man either. His hair is grizzled, and his face is marked. And his eyes are dull and weary. He has been at work all day, and he is still at work. Though it is now nine o'clock at night, he is not a working man, but a gentleman. He is a medical doctor. He is not thinking of the spring or of the green leaves or of the birds. He is thinking of nothing but his work. He is thinking of a case which he has to solve. and which is giving him a great deal of trouble. It is not a case of life and death, but it is a case which is very perplexing and very puzzling, and he can make nothing of it. He has been over it again and again. and he has taken every possible view of it. And he can make nothing of it. The more he thinks of it, the more perplexed he gets. And the more he tries to think of it in a different way, the more perplexed he gets. He has been at it, off and on, all day long, and he is still at it now, though it is nine o'clock at night. Suddenly, he gets up from his chair and walks across the room to the window. He stands there for a few moments, looking out into the street, and then he comes back to his chair and sits down and begins to think again. I think I went through something when I wrote that, but my teacher praised it. She even sent it to a magazine. They published it. My mom was so proud, even though she did not understand a word I've written. And then I went on to college. I was young and idealistic, and I had the world at my feet. I was also broke, stressed, and often felt like I was barely scraping by. But looking back, those years were some of the best of my life. I remember the first day of college like it was yesterday. I was so excited to be starting a new chapter in my life. I had no idea what was in store for me, but I was ready for anything. And boy, did college throw me for a loop. There were the all-nighters studying for exams, the never-ending papers to write, and the constant stress of trying to keep my grades up. But there were also the amazing friends I made, 
the incredible experiences I had and the lessons I learned. Those years were tough, but they were also some of the best years of my life. I wouldn't trade them for anything. I graduated college in May of 1999 and, like many of my fellow graduates, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I had majored in English and while I loved reading and writing, I had no idea how to turn that into a career. So I did what many recent college graduates do and I started searching for a job. The job market was not great in 1999. The dot-com bubble had just burst and many companies were downsizing or going out of business altogether. I applied for dozens of jobs, but I only got a handful of interviews. I was getting desperate. Finally, I landed a job as a customer service representative for a small company. It wasn't my dream job, but it was a job. I was grateful to have it. I worked long hours and weekends, but I was happy to have a steady paycheck. Eventually, I started to move up in the company. I got promoted to a manager position and then to a director position. I was doing well, but I still wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with my life. Then, in 2008, the economy tanked. My company downsized and I was out of a job. I was in my early 30 seconds and I had to start over. I took some time off to figure out what I wanted to do. I considered going back to school but I decided that wasn't the right path for me. Instead, I started my own business. It was a risk, but it paid off. I'm now in my early 40 seconds and I'm doing what I love. I'm my own boss and I get to help other people achieve their dreams. If I could go back and give my younger self some advice, I would tell him to be patient and to keep searching for his passion. It might take a while, but it will be worth it in the end. Looking back at my time working in customer service, I both miss it and at the same time I would never go back. However, customer service is one of the most important aspects of any business. It is the face of the company and the first point of contact for many customers. It is important to provide excellent customer service in order to keep customers happy and to ensure they keep coming back. There are a few key things to remember when working in customer service. The first is to be friendly and helpful at all times. This means being patient with customers, even when they are angry or upset. It is also important to be efficient and organized, so that customers do not have to wait long for assistance. Another important aspect of customer service is being able to upsell. This means convincing customers to buy more expensive items or add-ons without being pushy. It is important to strike a balance between being too pushy and not pushy enough. Finally, 
it is important to always follow up with customers. This means sending thank you notes after a purchase or following up after a service call to make sure the customer is satisfied. Following up shows that you care about your customers and their experience with your company. Providing excellent customer service is essential to the success of any business. By following these tips, you can ensure that your customers are always happy with their experience. I'm not sure what I expected when I took my first job, but it certainly wasn't what I ended up getting. I was young and naive and thought that working would be a breeze. I mean, how hard could it be? You just show up and do your thing, right? Wrong. Working is hard. It's not just the physical labor that can be tough, but the mental labor as well. You have to be constantly thinking about what you're doing and making sure that you're doing it right. And if you're not careful, you can easily make a mistake that can cost you your job. But it's not all bad. Working can be rewarding, both financially and emotionally. It can give you a sense of purpose and satisfaction. And it can be a lot of fun, too. I've had some of the best times of my life while working. So, if you're thinking about getting a job, go for it. It's not always easy, but it's worth it. There are many benefits to working hard. One of the most obvious benefits is that it can lead to success. Hard work is often a necessary component of success. If you want to achieve something, you need to be willing to put in the effort. Additionally, hard work can lead to personal satisfaction. Even if you don't achieve your goal, you can still feel proud of yourself for putting in the effort. Another benefit of hard work is that it can help you build character. People who work hard are often seen as being more reliable and responsible. They're also often seen as being more resilient because they've had to overcome challenges in their lives. Hard work can also teach you important life lessons. However, it is also important to know the value of relaxing. In our fast-paced, constantly connected world, it's more important than ever to take some time out for ourselves and relax. Whether it's taking a few deep breaths, going for a walk in nature, or spending time with loved ones, relaxation can help reduce stress, improve our mood, and boost our overall health. There are many different ways to relax. And what works for one person may not work for another. However, there are some general tips that can help everyone find a way to relax that works for them. First, it's important to find a quiet, comfortable place to relax. This could be a room in your home, a park, or anywhere else that feels calm and safe. Once you've found a good spot, 
Try to focus on your breathing and let go of any thoughts or worries that are on your mind. If your mind wanders, simply bring your focus back to your breath. Another great way to relax is to get moving. Exercise releases endorphins, which have mood-boosting effects. Even a short walk can help reduce stress and improve your overall sense of well-being. Finally, try to focus on the present moment and savor the simple joys in life. This could be anything from enjoying a cup of coffee to taking a few moments to appreciate the beauty of nature. Relaxation is a valuable tool that can help us cope with stress, boost our mood, and improve our overall health. By taking some time out of our busy schedules to relax, we can recharge our batteries, refocus our minds, and feel ready to take on whatever life throws our way. So next time you're feeling overwhelmed, take a deep breath and remember that relaxation is just a few minutes away. Not that I know anything. I'm just some dude with a podcast. Good night.